region for, for 100 years has had a very close relationship with Nigeria from a missionary perspective. That's why I grew up there. Um, but it's never pivoted from sort of missions and charity to business. And in the end of the day, um, what Africa needs now is not the aid, um, but it needs that investment. It needs those investment dollars. Welcome to Acton Line, a product of the Acton Institute for the Study of Religion and Liberty. I'm Eric Cohn, executive producer. For today's episode, we're bringing you a rebroadcast of an Acton Line episode from June 2023. Anyone of a certain age will remember the massive hit that was We Are the World, the Michael Jackson, Lionel Richie, and Quincy Jones produced charity single by USA for Africa. The considerable profits from that hit song went to the USA for Africa Foundation, which used them for relief of famine and disease in Africa. Even though Africa is an enormous and diverse continent, 54 sovereign countries, many people in the United States and much of the West were left with the impression of Africa as destitute and poverty stricken. What they may not realize is the enormous amount of growth and development that Africa has been seeing. To help us better understand this growth and development, particularly in the country of Nigeria, today I talk with Weba Bohr and Dunladi Verhayen. Weba Bohr is the president of Calvin University here in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and Dunladi Verhayen is the co-founder and managing partner of Varad Capital Management, a leading West African private equity investor. Today I talk with them about their experiences growing up in Nigeria and what they are seeing with the booming growth that that country is experiencing. You can find additional resources in the show notes for this episode, as well as find previous episodes of Acton Line on our website at acton.org slash actonline. And if you like this program, you can help us reach even more listeners by sharing it with a friend and leaving us a five-star review on Apple Podcasts. We welcome your comments as well. Acton Line is available on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen. Dr. Weba Bohr is the president of Calvin University in Grand Rapids, Michigan. He has spent two decades serving in the private and social sectors in four countries on two continents. His work is consistently focused on leveraging private capital to create social impact. Bohr earned a doctorate and two master's degrees from Yale University and a bachelor's degree from Calvin, all in history. He has served professionally in economic development, management consulting, philanthropy, and impact investing. For 12 years, Bohr lived in Lagos, Nigeria, most recently serving as CEO of All On, a renewable energy investment fund of Shell. Born and raised in Nigeria as the son of Christian Reformed Church missionaries, Bohr holds citizenship in the Netherlands, Canada, and the United States. Donlati Verhayen is a co-founder and managing partner of Varad Capital Management. Prior to founding Varad, Dunladi held roles at Citibank Nigeria, Ocean and Oil Holdings, and at McKinsey and Company. He also sits on the board of the African Venture Capital Association and the Private Equity and Venture Capital Association of Nigeria. He was named a young global leader by the World Economic Forum in 2014. He received a degree in electrical engineering from Calvin College and in Engineering, Economic Systems, and Operations Research from Stanford University, and an MBA from Harvard Business School. Weba Bohr and Dunladi Verhayen, welcome to Acton Line. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Uh, I want to start with, before we get into our conversation, I want to give both of you a chance to introduce yourself to the audience, tell a little bit about your background, what you have done, what you're doing now. Uh, Weba, we'll start with you. Yeah, mine will be much quicker. Dunladi's is a, is a much longer story. So. <laughs> of accomplishments. Yeah, yeah so um, I was uh, born and raised in Nigeria as a, as a missionary kid um, and actually in, you know, went to a, a mission school there and in grade five, actually Dunladi came to the same school and we've been close friends ever since. Um, finished high school there and then came to Calvin College at the time. Uh, and then from Calvin, I did a degree in history, then went to Yale University. Um, while in my, uh, while I was in Nigeria doing my doctoral research, um, Dunladi and I co-founded with, with a bunch of other friends, uh, an internet service provider in Nigeria. Um, one of the first ones in central Nigeria, certainly the first one in the city we grew up in of Joss, um, and built it into a, you know, decently sized, fast growing business, 
um, you know, and then over time it eventually went bankrupt. So that was our first experience of being entrepreneurial together. Um, and we still remain friends, which I think is very important. Uh, but that experience kind of taught me that um, I was really ex interested in, in entrepreneurship and, and sort of the, more of the private sector. And so from, from completing my doctorate, I then didn't stay in academia uh, and then spent the last 20 years mostly in Africa um, working in various um, either for-profit or not-for-profits, but even in the not-for-profits like Rockefeller Foundation, Tony Alumalu Foundation, it was always focused on kind of building business, entrepreneurship, and that kind of thing across the continent. Dunlady, you? Hey, thanks. Uh, as you can see, my background is quite intertwined with Weavers. Uh, I consider him to be a, a really good friend, but also my, my, my older brother. I was a year behind him in, in high school. And I actually followed him after our high school experience in, in northern Nigeria to Calvin College. Uh, where I came out of the degree in electrical engineering. So I went to the West Coast and got a master's in operations research. Um, wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, so I went to work for McKinsey. I thought it'd be a good way of, of seeing the business world and working in different sectors, um, different geographies, which McKinsey Chicago helped me uh, to do and experience. And then I felt very much homesick. I wanted to return back to Africa, the continent. Um, and so I got a job with an investment firm in Africa, and they were trying to do some entrepreneurial things. They're trying to invest in, in different segments and different sectors. They invest a lot of money into the oil and gas space. Um, and we were trying to raise a private equity fund to invest into more consumer oriented businesses. Uh, worked, with, worked with that team for a number of years. In between, I went to business school, got a, a, an MBA from Harvard Business School, and came back to Nigeria, continued to do the same thing, working on investments locally. Um, uh, I went late after that, I went to work at Citibank, where I, I did some work in corporate finance, financing larger infrastructure, infrastructure type projects and telco projects in Nigeria. And I really didn't enjoy that. I really enjoyed the more entrepreneurial business building, uh, working with smaller businesses. And so I set up a, a private equity fund in a quite a private equity firm in 2008 with a good friend of mine. Um, and our idea was just to raise capital to invest in small and small and medium sized businesses. Um, to help the continent develop and been doing that for 15 years. And it's just been a, a, a wonderful experience um, deploying capital and uh, supporting the you know, small business growth. Both of you have a background, the country of Nigeria. So I want to give you both an opportunity and then Lottie, I'll start with you. Um, tell our audience about Nigeria. I mean, I think there are a lot, we have a largely Western audience that listens to this podcast. Uh, I think, you know, they'll, they'll, know a little bit maybe about Nigeria, but certainly won't have a deep perspective on it. So like, tell, tell our audience more about the country of Nigeria. Nigeria could speak for a long time on Nigeria, but basically summary is Nigeria, I believe is a hidden gem, right? Um, very few people know a lot about Nigeria, as you just mentioned, but it, play, it you know, it's, it's, it's a massive market and plays a very, very important role in Africa and therefore I believe in the world. And if we look, if we just go to Africa, first of all, right? Africa is largely a forgotten continent. Um, yet the continent of Africa, if you actually, the continent of Africa is larger in size than US, Canada, Western Europe, China, Australia, like all those countries and or continents can fit on the one continent of Africa. So it, it, it's really, really massive, right? With 1.3, 1.3 billion people today, which is the population of India and China. Um, but in the next sort of 30, 40 years, Africa is expected to have a population of double the size of both those countries combined, right? So it's, it's just massive, massive growth, big, op big, big opportunities for, for business. Uh, Nigeria is the largest, content, largest country on the continent of Africa. Nigeria has 250 million people. So one in five Africans is Nigerian. One in six black people walking around any parts of the earth is Nigerian. So it's a massive market. Uh, it's growing very fast, extremely fast. Birth rates of five kids per female on average, which is just huge. Um, and it's soon projected to be the third most populated country in, in the world after India and uh, China on its own. So great potential, uh, lots of natural resources. Um, as, and as you can tell, just from the, from the, from the population, that, that just creates a massive workforce as well as a massive consumer base to sell products and services into. So um, I'm a huge fan of Nigeria. I know I'm biased. Um, but I think that the, the, the world can afford not to look at Nigeria for a source of growth. 
Weba, you mentioned that you uh, were born there as a missionary kid, so you had a slightly different perspective on all of this. Tell us about your experience with Nigeria. Yeah, um, I did. I did go back as a as a as an adult, and actually the, spent twelve years there from two thousand ten the, before actually coming back here to to work at Calvin University. So I do also have a pretty recent um, experience, and seeing it as an adult is very different as seeing it as a, as a child. Um, I think as as kids, you know, where we grew up in Joss, Nigeria, was sort of like paradise, um, the best place on earth to grow up. Um, but you see Nigeria as an adult; it's very different. It's very different, um, but equally just like Dunladi said, a hidden gem. Um, you know, largest market, largest population in Africa, growing fast. Um, now, you know, a lot of what you hear from Nigeria, and this is similar to most of Africa, is always negative. What you don't hear about is the growth and the success and the opportunity, right? So within that fast-growing population are so many highly talented and well-educated young people who are really doing amazing things. Um, unfortunately, right now, many of them are leaving the country for opportunities. Um, but there's a reason why Canada and the UK in particular are really targeting young Nigerians to come um, as part of their, you know, sort of professional immigration strategies, because they know these are the young people who are really dynamic, hardworking, and going to add a lot to their economies. But back in Nigeria, I mean, again, you know, you hear about, you know, elections about this and that, that's n generally negative. But what you don't hear is, you know, one of the fastest growing media industries in the world. Um, Nigerian music and movies are taking over the world right now. Um, you look at fintech. Uh, you have, you know, every every quarter, or every couple of months, you hear of another Nigerian unicorn, um, usually started by young Nigerians with almost no backing and no kind of regulatory or really government support um, and, are, and are designing and creating these new kind of fintech companies that are growing really fast. Um, and are creating, you know, products that fit with that market in a way that uh, that other companies that have tried in these markets don't work. So when I was the last five years before coming back here, um, I was running an investment fund. Um, sometimes Dunladi and I were looking at the same deals. Sometimes we were competing against each other in deals. Um, and I think sometimes he got the better ones, but, but that's another story. Um, but within that, you know, within a five-year period, we built a portfolio of about 50 companies in the renewable energy space just in Nigeria. And it was just amazing how many of these companies were run by teams of, you know, Nigerian um, entrepreneurs in their mid-20s. Um, who had just, you know, defied all the odds and just had these great ideas of how to fix a major problem in their own country, a, the power problem, um, in an innovative way. And these were kind of the entrepreneurs we were betting on again and again and again. And I kept just seeing every time you think, okay, that must be the end. That must be the last great idea. And then the next day you hear another one and then you hear another one. Um, and so it was really inspiring. And, and that's the side of Nigeria and then Africa generally that we really need to hear more about. Then Lottie, I, the question I wanted to ask, and, and Weba kind of hinted at a little bit, and I'll give you a chance to come back and, and expand on that as well. Uh, what do you think people in the West get wrong in their impressions of uh, Africa in general um, and to the extent that, uh, that they're knowledgeable or think about Nigeria? What, what, do they, what do they get wrong? What do we get wrong in the West about Africa and what is happening in Africa in terms of development? It's a very good question. I think there are potentially two things um, we both touched on, 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 on them. Um, one is just the availability of talent. There is a lot of really, really great talent locally um, within you know, business, and science, um, music, um, um, acting, drama. So you know, there's a lot of local talent that's available, right? Um, a lot of folks just don't, don't have the same opportunity for that talent to emerge. But if you look at, again, if you look, you know, the many different fields, um, you know, amongst, the, I, I think the demographic within the U.S. that has the highest number of master's degrees as a portion of population are Nigerians and Ghanaians, right, in the U.S. Um, you know, you've got hospitals full of Nigerian doctors and nurses. You've got the NBA games that just played recently and you know you had three Nigerian artists playing in a halftime show, right? Which has never happened before. You've got the NBA draft and you've got far more Nigerians joining the draft as before. So just, you know, across the field of again, athletics, music, um, and and the business world, um, you just have a lot more Nigerians coming to the fore. And this a lot of people are not don't don't know, right? But it's it's happening. 
Uh, the second is sort of the economic potential of the continent, which we've also sp spoken about. I think people can't grasp the size of this continent, which is why I, I try to lay out, like if you just look at things geographically, how big Africa is from a population standpoint, how, how, how massive it is, right? And this is an opportunity, but it's also a threat, right? Um, so, you know, from the, from the, another lens, I feel, and this is a, a, it's a massive drive uh, for me uh, and my business and for many other folks. I feel like one of my, my, my raison d'etre is to create jobs. If we don't create jobs for this population boom, then it's going gonna, it's gonna to be a little problem for the world. I think today, and, and this is a scary point, I think, but it's, I think it's real. If we think there's a migration issue, and there is a migration issue, the southern borders of the US, migration issues coming into uh, Europe, right? Uh, lots of migrants coming by boats into Italy, into Spain. We hear about this in news all the time. Um, with the population of Africa today, or is projected to go, you know, if we don't create jobs on the continent, it's going to be not 10 times worse, maybe 100 times worse, right? So for me, it's, there's an opportunity there, but then there's also, um, there, there's a responsibility that some of us, many of us have to create jobs on the continent. And the talent is there, right? It's about devoting resources um, and helping to drive the right policies such that more businesses can flourish, more people can be employed. I'll speak for myself as a, uh, uh, I've been told that the term for people born uh, when, around the time I was is elderly millennial, which I've got a, I've got a bone to pick with whoever is picking these, <laughs> this terminology. But I feel that so much of the perception that my generation would have uh, of Africa in general is tied back to popular culture. Um, and you think of USA for Africa and you think of we are the world and this impression that is given off of just, it is, you know, uh, poverty all the way down. And um, the, the stories that you're telling and that I've been uh, been able to become familiar with through my professional work, including here at the Acton Institute is just how non-representative that is and how complicated that aid relationship, uh, if you want to go back to like USA to Africa and other attempts like that, uh, um, has been so. Uh, feel, feel free to expand more. Like, you know, what do we get wrong here in the West and our perceptions of Africa? How, to what extent are we still clinging to that, um, you know, rock chorus influenced perception of this continent and the countries that make it up? Yeah, that's a great question. And um, you know, Ethiopia itself is actually a country. You know, that was where USA for Africa and and Band Aid and all that was focused. Um, in the 2010s, for most years, Ethiopia was, if not the fastest, the second or third fastest growing economy in the world throughout the entire decade. Um, you know, they've gone a little off track right now, um, but that was the story. But nobody ever heard that story, right? Everybody still thinks of Ethiopia as that, you know, mid, mid 1980s famine country, right? Not the fastest growing yeah, They think country. of Sally Struthers being there rather than uh, the story of development. Exactly. Yeah. And so Ethiopia, I mean, they've built massive industries. You know, they're, they're now one of the largest exporters of horticulture um, produce into Europe. They're massive in coffee. They're massive in, you know, sort of light, light manufacturing and all that. And that's all been, that was all growing very fast. So, um, and, and even infrastructure, you know, trains, monorails, all these kinds of things in Addis Ababa. Uh, but that was never, never talked about. So I think that's the main thing is people only hear the negative. Like right now, what is the only thing you're hearing coming out of Africa? It's Sudan. It's the conflict in Sudan. It's not the fact that Africa's economy as a whole, the African economy is growing at twice the pace of the global average. That's what you don't hear. You don't hear that there's a trillion dollar consumer economy. That's a trillion dollar growth economy that's rising. Um, and these are the things that people don't hear. And so they... As investors, you kind of um, misprice the risk of of Africa, um, and I saw this as a, as a as an investor. Many of the many of the companies we invested in, we were a fund in Nigeria. Many of the co companies we invested in, you know, like international funds wouldn't touch them, but then we found them, we invested in them, and then suddenly they were now, oh wow, this is a great company. Why did we not hear about this? Um, because, you know, most investors were looking at sort of those foreign companies operating in Africa and, and didn't believe that there was this in homegrown talent that you could invest in. And in, in the reality is in the portfolio that we had built in that investment company, it was the small number of non-Nigerian companies that had come into the market that actually struggled the most. 
and it was the homegrown companies that were the fastest growing because they knew the market. Uh, but a typical investor would have looked at them and just said, oh, the risk is too high um, because of all these stereotypes. So I think it's just it's such a clear example of where we get it wrong. Um, we actually had the president of the African Development Bank came and did the Calvin University commencement address this year. Um, the African Development Bank is is rated as the number one development bank in the world, $208 billion balance sheet. And he we had a, um, a reception for him downtown here uh, w- with a number of kind of business leaders in the region. And these, these are all, you know, very astute businessmen and women who have built phenomenal, you know, global companies, but almost none of them are in Africa in any meaningful way. And and they were just shocked when, you know, President Adeshina was talking about all the opportunities, the growth and all that. And every one of them was, oh, we need to get there. We need to get there. And what's interesting is this region for for 100 years has had a very close relationship with Nigeria from a missionary perspective. That's why I grew up there. Um, but it's never pivoted from sort of missions and charity to business. And in the end of the day, um, what Africa needs now is not the aid, um, but it needs that investment. It needs those investment dollars because that's what generates growth. That's what generates wealth. That's what create draw- jobs like what Dunlady said. Um, so we just need to change that narrative and start investing in a meaningful way um, and, and realizing that, yeah, okay, there was, there's some risk the risk is different from here or other markets, but not necessarily greater. So the story that you've told of this uh, incredible development is going on there um, and then compare that back to what we just started talking about with the perception that people in the West have of Africa. What changed? What has unleashed this kind of development that is, uh, that is going on that you've both detailed so far? I think the world has become more global, Right. Um, so, you know, information travels a lot easier. Um, that's one, uh, two, a lot of global markets are slowing down and people do realize people are searching for growth and the growth opportunity in Africa is becoming just a lot more evident to folks as companies do search for growth. You've got a lot of, um, countries that are aging, right? With birth rates that are far below replacement value. Um, so even national national policies um, have have uh, are forcing their own businesses to look for, for areas of growth. Um, you've got talent, so sort of you know Africans who went to the U.S. or to U.K. or to Germany or other countries to be educated, um, maybe might have spent some time working in companies or startups in those regions. And they're all coming back to Africa, or they have been coming back in waves. Actually, they make sometimes they come and they they all leave in waves, and then they come back again. Uh, but a lot of these younger entrepreneurs have come back to set up businesses and grow businesses. Um, so I think there are a, a, a number of factors that have led to, to to this slow change. It's it's not happening fast enough. Um, like Weibo said, I mean, the relationship with Africa is mostly one of sort of you know um, religion, but also it's been very extractive. Where you know relationship development focused on you know getting oil and gas, so crude oil, getting various minerals, be that gold, copper, cobalt, or whatever else it is for manufacturing or agricultural products. And now folks are looking to Africa for sort of a the market opportunity to export businesses and export products into Africa, um, but also to buy. And this is what Africa really needs is to buy to, to buy or to sell more finished goods to the rest of the world, right? And I would add. I would add to that in terms of kind of what changed is that I think um, in maybe earlier generations, um, Dunladi and I are technically the generation before millennials. Um, I, I, you, I look like it, but Dunladi looks like he's, he's more like Gen Z. Um, <laughs> we, I'm a millennial. Speak for yourself. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> no, <laughs> we're born in I'm the young. 70s, man. Um, so I, I think earlier generations, it was kind of they were still waiting for the government to kind of get things going. Um, and then I think sort of the, the the younger millennials and then the generations after have kind of said, look, we can't wait for them anymore because that promise has never come. And so they just did it on their own. And so if you look at, um, you know, the entertainment industry in Nigeria, this one that everyone always talks about, you know, um, it, it's it's booming. It's, you know, generating billions of dollars of GDP. The government did absolutely nothing to enable it, Right. Um, and that may be why it actually worked, because the young people just took their creativity and took it to the world and, and built businesses around it. 
Um, obviously, these businesses could be better structured. Um, so a lot of the earlier contracts for some of these Nigerian, uh, you know, musicians and 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 movie makers and actors and actresses, um, you know, their contracts weren't great. They didn't get a lot of the kind of they didn't make a lot of the money from it. Um, but that's getting a lot more sophisticated. So that 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 wealth is being generated in Africa, creating jobs. Um, and it's really exciting. But again, they didn't. These guys didn't say, "Let's wait for the government to put in place a policy or to put in place studios that we can operate from." They just went with it. Um, and I think that's what's happening across different sectors. Uh, you know, not you know, let's wait for the government to get everything perfect, but let's just run with it. Now, there are some countries. Um, you know, Botswana is often seen as that success case from from early on. You know, when diamonds were discovered, they 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 built an economy on the diamonds. Um, that wasn't purely extractive, and and the government of Botswana was always inter- focusing on the good of their country and their economy, not just the quick, quick win, the quick money, um, and that was that's always been seen sort of it as an example. Unfortunately, it's a small population. There needs to be a lot more countries doing that, but you know you see countries like Rwanda um, that are kind of following a Singapore development model, and you know every time you go to Rwanda, every two or three years, there's something new and different and exciting. And you just look at them and say, "Wow, this country has almost no natural resources, and yet they've they've been building and growing because of a very, very um, close focus on strategy." And okay, there's only so much we can do, so let's do those, and then the next, and then the next, and keep building. Um, you know, there's um, the East African region. You know, it's not perfect, but it's doing quite well. They've built kind of their own their own market, um, their own sort of internal market amongst those countries there, which obviously helps with trade. Um, you know, countries like uh, Senegal are doing very well. Morocco is doing great. Um, you know, Ghana has has been building a great story, but um, you know, a, f- a few steps back recently. But there's a lot of countries that are pretty exciting in what's happening. And then I think what's also great now is there's now an Africa Free Trade Agreement, which is basically the entire continent is building this idea of let's trade more with each other. Um, and that is really exciting. It's the largest trade block in the world now by number of countries and population. Um, and, you know, a lot of the, you know, like Dunlady said, a lot of the industries in Africa, a lot of the economy has been built on extraction. And so even the infrastructure doesn't link, you know, it, there's no road that goes from Nairobi to Lagos, or there's no road that goes from Kinshasa to, you know, um, or no, no good road, let me say, like Kinshasa to Cairo. Um, and because of that, so much of the economy was always let's extract it, get it to the port, get it out of Africa, and then we buy back the finished goods. But with this free trade agreement and with a bigger focus on infrastructure that links economies within Africa, uh, I think that the story is going to get even better and better. Denlati, you'd mentioned a few moments ago that uh, this kind of development could be happening faster. We could be getting more of it. What, what do both of you see as the biggest roadblocks, the biggest inhibitors to growth and development? Things that if they were changed, be it um, law, regulation, cultural changes, uh, what are the biggest things holding back greater and faster growth and development in Nigeria and, and the rest of Africa? I would say maybe a couple of things. One, if we just start off with infrastructure, right? Um, Africa needs a lot of infrastructure, right? Um, infrastructure is the bedrock. So I, I think infrastructure with the right policies is just a bedrock to allow, to unleash the entrepreneurial spirit in folks. And uh, we are extremely entrepreneurial, but we haven't had the right business policies, to be frank. And certainly there's fair little infrastructure, right? We were just mentioned that, you know, the roads that we're missing, uh, you know, rail infrastructure, all the railroads in Nigeria are still railroads that were built, you know, a hundred years ago to move cotton and to move peanuts and to move other natural resources from various parts of the country straight to the ports. They were not meant for regional connectivity in any way, right? Um, we need ports. You know, if I, I look outside, if I go to, to a harbor, you see ships that are waiting for, say, 20 days to dock because there's just not enough capacity at the ports for the ships to come in. Um, so just real is power, right? I think the city of Manhattan consumes or, you know, generates and consumes more power than all of Kenya, right? It's, it's, it's just outstanding. I think more power is consumed by the fridges in the U.S., right, than each African on a per capita basis, 
It's just, it's, it's incredible. So we have no power. Without power, you cannot industrialize. Now to do all this, you need massive amounts of capital. And so I think that's a missing gap. Um, I, I don't see why the continent cannot be growing at 10% GDP growth rate like China did for you know quite a while without the right infrastructure. That requires investments. So I think that that's key. And then second, on the policy side, it's just about um, you know um, it's about giving the right advice to our policymakers. I think policy is generally becoming a lot better. Niebu spoke about the Continental Free Trade Agreement, which is just going to be a, a massive push in the right direction. Um, but just a, a greater focus, I believe, by many of our governments, and so we take responsibility on on improving the ease of doing business would be fantastic. In some countries, it could take you two months, three months just to register a business, right? Where elsewhere it may take you 24 hours. And this is where I think we can, we as Africans can do a better job of coming to seek out best practices in some Western nations and try to implement these in on the continent. And various organizations like the World Bank, the IMF, a number of uh, yeah, large DFIs are supporting African governments with this, um, but that work needs to continue. So, so, to, so for me, those are two things, better policies and regulations to ease business, and then infrastructure, which requires just a lot of money, like billions and billions of dollars for investments. The capital needed for that infrastructure development, um, is it... Is there a lack of interest on the capital side in investing in the infrastructure? Are they kind of slow to move to the market there? Or is it, uh, is it government policy that is uh, inhibiting that kind of capital being invested to do that kind of infrastructure development? Is it a combination of both? What is, uh, what's the roadblock there? It's interesting. You know, capital flows where it can get a risk-adjusted return, right? That's attractive. Today, um, you know, so if I look at my, in my space, private equity, the private equity space, right? Um, today, funds in the US, Western Europe, in parts of Eastern Europe can generate 20% dollar returns to their investors, right? If that's the case, will that same capital come to Africa um, for longer term projects that are perceived to be riskier and are potentially slightly more risky? right? Um, what would be the incremental return required for that capital comes to Africa? Now, is that 500 basis points? Is that 1,000 basis points? It's probably somewhere in that range. Now, how many infrastructure projects can return 30% US dollar rates over a long period of time? They don't really exist, right? Um, so there is just competition for this capital, right? And there is less and less, there is some concession capital, but this, it's, it's just not enough. Now, I know there, there's also a lot of concern that's happened more recently about, you know, um, capital coming from China with fewer strings attached to it um, and better rates. And of course, you know, with sort of the geopolitical tensions between the West and China, there's some concern about that. But therefore, we are seeing a lot more infrastructure projects on the continent being financed by, by China because it has a lower uh, return requirement, right? And uh, I think this is something that, that the world sort of needs to decide on, right? Because, you know, um, if we're trying to get the returns we get elsewhere today in Africa, Africa just will not develop. But I think if if sufficient capital is devoted to Africa and develop this infrastructure and create the businesses, then suddenly this is a, a large market for the rest of the world. You'd mentioned in your introduction, telling us a little bit about uh, yourself and and how you two know each other, uh, this ISP business that had gone bankrupt. And I want to ask you about that because this is a bit of a hobby horse for me, uh, is divorcing in people's minds, particularly uh, Western and American minds, the association uh, with bankruptcy that is almost uh, inevitably tied to the game of Monopoly, that when you go bankrupt, the game is over, right? Uh which isn't reality. You know, there's certainly nobody wants to go bankrupt, but there's a purpose and a point to it, right? It helps you reorganize companies um, that can help them continue on after that. Uh, so that kind of, uh, the existence of it, the availability of that as a legal process is incredibly important. 
if you would tell us a little bit about your experience there and like what what lessons did you learn out of uh, that whole experience out of a, a company uh, going bankrupt that you know informed the way that uh, you uh, other enterprises that you've been involved with uh, you've proceeded there. Right, and just to be clear, Dunlady and I have been involved in a lot of other businesses that yes, yes, have yes, done yes. very well, <laughs> in, including an agriculture business that the two of us actually recently invested in as uh, on a personal level. So, um, but yeah, I think on that one, look, it was a group of friends. We were all in our early twenties, and we each put in you know a few thousand dollars from our savings. Like it wasn't you know this massive thing, and it did really well um, at first. And the focus was going to be to to bring kind of internet to second and third tier markets across northern Nigeria. And so even though we didn't know what the concept was then, in some ways it was sort of an early impact investment style because we were looking at it not just about making economic return, but we realized it could generate you know, economic growth and development in these cities. So, so that was kind of the focus. But we then, um, like this was almost unheard of at the time, we raised $400,000 um, in equity investment from a Nigerian bank, the uh, United Bank for Africa at the time. Um, the person who was the chairman then, his name was Hakim Bello Osagi. And, you know, I, we've we've met with him later and he said, look, I knew you guys were good. I knew it wasn't going to, you know, I, I kind of knew it wasn't going to succeed, but I just loved the story um, and what you guys were going to do, or what you guys were trying to do and, and how you were all, you know, you'd all gone abroad and you're all coming back to try and build this thing. Um, but in some ways that equity injection sort of maybe – took us in the wrong direction um, because it pushed us to go to Abuja rather than the second and third tier markets. And Abuja was one of, you know, it's a, it was the capital, you know, and so basically 90% of the Nigerian economy is in Lagos, Abuja, and Port Harcourt. And so we kind of, the data was, oh, we, we got to go to Abuja instead of these other cities. And we went to Abuja and kind of died there. Um, and so I think the lesson learned is, you know, often, you know, you, you need to always make sure that the capital you raise uh, and the direction you go, that you, you have you have to really think hard about why are you going against the strategy that you started with um, based on the capital you've raised. And and I think for me, that was kind of the biggest lesson. Um, I, Dunladi and I weren't sort of involved in the day-to-day by the time it, it, it went under. Um, as far as I know, there aren't significant um, bankruptcy protections in Nigeria. I don't know. Dunladi can, maybe can speak to this more. Um, but in many ways, it was a small enough business that it was sort of like the group of us just decided, okay, look, let's let's go on to other things. Um, you know, very few of us were involved in the day to day. But I think the lesson learned again was this thing of you know, stay true to your initial strategy, um, and don't don't always let the don't 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 always let the sort of big data distract you when you kind of as an entrepreneur know that the other the other road is 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 the one you should have done. Um, and then the other thing is. You know, I think now it's like failure is a badge of honor now with with kind of young entrepreneurs. So we at least have that badge of honor. <laughs> you know, it's funny. Um, one of the investors uh, who invested in, in in an early project um, that didn't go too well. Um, I mean, it, it was it was, really, it was really embarrassing, right? And yeah, to today, young founders, you know, happily tell you, yeah, fail three times, you know, keep on moving. But you know, back then, you wouldn't want to talk about your failure, right? You usually really took it to heart. Um, it was not a badge of honor in any way. It was it was, it was uh, the walk of shame, <laughs> you know. Uh, but we we did learn a lot. I think one of the other things that we learned in that first investment was uh, well, two things. One is the quality of the team. It was a phenomenal team, right? And I've always taken that to heart, and I've always realized that um, strong teams make the difference. And you know, in this case, uh, the business itself didn't do well. But I think we were aside from you know the the strategy shift that was made. Um, I think a bigger impact as well was technology coming in that none of us at that point of time could see because we were rolling out a chain of cyber cafes, but then also had call centers and calling cards to make international phone calls. And we started this business when there are 600,000 phone lines in the country. And so, you know, it was really attractive for folks to be able to walk to a cyber cafe and get online. Um, we had no sense that in a couple of years, there'll be a hundred million mobile phones floating around the country and everyone being able to make international calls, voice over IP, you know, free international calls on their phones effectively, right? Um, over the internet. And so that just completely just decimated our business. And so one of the lessons uh, that I took from that is, you know, in, in every business, just trying to think of 
of how technology could, can completely disrupt, you know, what we're doing today. Now, uh, very few of us are Steve Jobs is of this world, that Elon Musk is of this world who can, who really almost feel like can see the future. Uh, but still, we still put a lot more thought into, uh, you know, not trying to assume that the world is going to remain static. Of the world we're in today, like what can really change, what can really disrupt, and how do we prefer, prepare for disruption? And is this the team that can actually um, um, change the change the change the business and, and pivot pivot in a second if necessary? As we're kind of coming to the end here, uh, let's talk about what you guys are doing now. So, Dinlati, you're a co-founder and managing partner of Farad. Tell tell us about the work that uh, you're doing there and and that company is doing. So. Like I said at the beginning, Verod is a private equity fund. Uh, we invest in small and medium-sized businesses across Africa. And that's how we started out. Uh, we now also have a venture fund that invests in tech, tech-enabled tech companies across continent of Africa. Now, on the private equity side, we have raised uh, about $365 million in aggregate. That's been invested in about 30 companies to date, and we're still investing uh, that money. And it's, you know, we've so invested in, give you a sense, pharmaceutical uh, manufacturing companies, pharmaceutical retailers, um, K-12 schools, uh, fish farms, uh, fruit juice manufacturing businesses, a cosmetic retailer, um, apparel manufacturing companies. So really a diverse group of businesses, primarily in Nigeria and Ghana, right? Um, and like I said early on, the key emphasis has been creating jobs. So we have maybe close to 8,000 jobs, eight, 9,000 jobs have been created within the portfolio. Uh, we're really growing, um, growing pretty fast. And that's just been, you know, of immense satisfaction and pride to me. But I think we should, my, my goal is for creating 10,000 jobs a year. Actually, that's where I'd like to get to eventually because I think it's still a, a tiny drop in a bucket. Um, but that's just the main focus. So invest in small, small medium-sized businesses, invest, put, invest equity in these businesses, help them grow and then sell them to a larger strategic uh, company or, or um, to another financial investor. Now on the venture side, uh, there we run that business out of offices in Nigeria and, and uh, Kenya. We've got five colleagues there and they're investing in tech enabled businesses across the continent. So invested in, in uh, East Africa and West Africa and Egypt as well. Um, and there we've raised $43 million uh, primarily from Japanese corporate venture uh, arms who are very interested in the African opportunity. Because in Japan, what do you have? You have a lot of capital. We have a very aging demographic. In Africa, very little capital, but like we said early on, a very young and growing population. So there's a real, uh, real relationship, symbiotic relation, which was created by the two, the two regions, uh, which is what we're trying to do. Weba, you are the uh, now 12th president at Calvin University, which is here in Grand Rapids, Michigan. Um, tell us about how you got there and what's going on at Calvin and what your agenda for the university is as the 12th president. Well, yeah, that's a big question. We only have a few minutes. Um, that should be the, the subject of a whole session. But um, yeah, look, I mean, most of the last 10 years before I came to Calvin, um, I was investing in young African entrepreneurs in various ways, right? And in many ways, it was about unlocking their dreams. Um, so the pivot now to being the president of a university is actually, basically, I'm doing the same thing, right? Because people come to universities to unlock their dreams. Um, and so I'm still investing in young people. So it's not as big of a pivot as, as some people think. Um, and Dunladi and I are both Calvin alums. Um, he was one of the ones who really pushed me to, 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 to consider and take this role. And I, I, I thank you for the push. Uh, my brother. Um, but yeah, so Calvin, you know, it's one of the top Christian universities in the world. Um, 3,000 students, uh, but we're going to, we're, we're growing fast. Um, we have, you know, a, a hundred different degree programs that were solidly liberal arts, um, but we're kind of that school that does the both and, right? So we are liberal arts, but also really strong in professional programs, engineering, nursing, education, et cetera. Um, and what we what we do at Calvin is, you know, if you're an engineer, you've still taken history and philosophy and religion. Um, if you're a historian, you've still taken science. Um, and so everybody comes out of there really, really well-rounded, which is kind of why Dunladi and I could both go to Calvin, get very different degrees, and almost end up in the same sector and then go in different directions again uh, because you get that real kind of diverse um, 
kind of academic grounding that kind of you can pivot anywhere. Um, yeah, so it's a it's a it's a great university here. Um, I'm really proud to say we are one of the most international universities, Christian University of the United States, and most diverse. Um, this incoming class next year may may have as many as 20 percent of the of the student body maybe from different countries around the world, um, and so it's really a place that people come from all over the world and come here to Grand Rapids, and you know get to know each other, build relationships. Um, and and study and learn together, so that when they when they graduate from here, whether they're from Grand Rapids, or they're from Lagos, you know they leave with with a great grounding and a great academic grounding, a great faith grounding, uh, but also great friendships that they now take into their life and and sort of as they build through their career, um, they now interact with people not just in their county but from across the world. Um, yeah, so we are um, we've just opened a new business school last year. Um, the next thing we're working on is a big school of health. Um, and then there's some other programs working on building some outdoor athletic facilities, building a new student union. Um, so a lot of energy happening there and, uh, you know, really excited about it. And um, I have to say, thank you, Dunlady, for pushing me um, to take this call. Um, and uh, it, it has been it has been an absolute um, honor uh, to be back here and to be leading this great institution. One final question for both of you, and I want to come back to Nigeria for this question. We've uh, talked a lot about the the history in the past, the growth and development that has been going on in recent years. Um, what is next for Nigeria? What what do you see coming down the uh, on the horizon? What is around the bend for that country in terms of the story of uh, development and its its growth as a nation? Yeah, so I'll take that first, and then Dunlady will Dunlady will will be the closer. Yeah, so Nigeria just had an election, and so there's going to be an administrative change with a new president. Um, you know, there's a lot of kind of controversy and concern about that. Uh, it wasn't the smoothest of elections, um, but I think the new president coming in, the one the one thing that he has done that everybody agrees with is he knows how to build teams of really good and competent people. Um, and so we're looking to a government and a cabinet that's very strong. Uh, very, very talented, and that can help kind of turn Nigeria in the direction of a more business-friendly um, country where it's not only the, the the sectors like, you know, entertainment and all that that don't involve the government, but it's the whole economy um, where you are going to see growth and we're going to see government enabling that. Um, so I think that's what we see is coming. That's what we're hoping for because like Dunlady said, that fast-growing population, it can be an advantage um, but if, if, you know, if the government of Nigeria, this coming administration, doesn't make drastic changes, both in the kind of attitude towards business, but also the policy towards business, um, and the jobs that we need are not created fast enough, that population growth could, could lead in a very different direction. So it's at a pivotal moment where we need to get it right now, um, or the future might not be good. Um, but if we get it right now, Nigeria can become an economic world power within, within five to 10 years. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's really hard to 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 uh, add much more to that. But that's a position I've been for a long part of my life behind Weba. Um, you know, um, no, he, he's entirely right. I mean, you know, un- unfortunately, I think we've had uh, a little bit too much government intervention in various sectors um, in the last couple of years, and we sort of have enough examples around the world how that does not typically uh, bode too well. Uh, the new administration coming in is extremely pro private sector, um, pro private sector growth, and you know this means that I think the governments will be actually pulling their hands out of um, a lot of things they're trying to get involved with before, and just create this enabling environment for free enterprise and business growth. And so um, I think particularly the business community is extremely excited about what's to come. Um, like we both said, the elections uh, were were difficult, uh, but I think uh, very quickly sentiments will change as as um, there are there are some hard decisions the government needs to to enact very quickly. So, you know, um, there are a couple of government subsidies, for instance, fuel subsidies that the government needs to pull. Um, we've got a, we've got multiple exchange rates of currencies. They need to collapse this into one exchange rate. That will create some short term pain, but over the mid to long term will be very, very good for economic growth. And I think a lot of people recognize this. So um, so the summary is we're very excited about the next couple of years for Nigeria. I think Nigeria can finally emerge um, from where it has been. 
in the last decade or so. Weba Bohr, Dunlady Verheyen, thanks so much for joining us today on Act in Line. Thanks so much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. As always, thank you for listening. Our team loves putting this podcast together for you. It's encouraging to hear from our listeners. Feedback is incredibly important to us because it lets us know what you'd like to hear more of, including the kinds of topics you're interested in most. If you have comments, feedback, or ideas for a show topic or interesting guest, you can email our team at producer at actin.org. Until next week, for Actin Line, I'm Eric Cohn.